being a part of the Timur Film Festival. Today is our third day and we have a beautiful journey for you. Every year when uh, we are about to promote or whenever we have our meetings for the Timur Film Festival, what we do is choose an artist. Um, that artist, we usually use their work on all of our promotional materials. And this year we have chosen Damali Abrams. And she is a Guyanese artist who resides in New York. However, we want Damali to tell you more about herself. So here's an interview with Damali. Hello everyone, and welcome to day three of the Tamari Film Festival. I'm Ramona Lucas, one of the founders of the festival. And with me is Damali Abrams, the festival artist for 2020. Say hi, Damali. Hi. Um, so we're starting off today in conversation with Damali. Um, and so Damali, right? Instead of reading your bio um, and starting the conversation there, um, I think I, I would just want to say you're like, you, you are a Queens born, Queens, New York born um, artist of Guyanese parentage. Um, and coming from that perspective, you know, can you tell us a bit of who you are? Like, who is Damali Abrams? Um, okay, well, thank you so much for having me and thank you for having my art be part of the festival. I'm really excited about that. Um, so basically, I'm an artist and an educator and um, my work is interdisciplinary. It also involves healing work and my work, I work across mixed media, mixed media collage, uh, performance art, video, social media. I see those all as part of my art practice. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm an artist. That's basically who I am at heart. But yeah, I also teach at York College in Jamaica, Queens. So, okay. So then how, how did you... How did you come to art as the thing that, that, that you do? Um, well, when I was small growing up, I was always drawn to the arts. So um, I was always dancing and I was always writing when I was younger. A lot of dance performances, dance classes, dance recitals, and then um, into college, still dancing and writing, a lot of creative writing, poetry, short stories. And then towards the end of college, I started to be interested in visual art more and so work in collage. And then that became my main way of expressing myself. But it, for me, it's always been a way to um, express myself, a way to heal, to deal with anxiety and depression and things that I couldn't express in other ways, I could always express through creative means. So that's always been my outlet. Right. So for you, art is practice, not necessarily um, product, but practice. It's it's a way of, of of moving through the world and processing life as it as it happens. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, all right. Um, so speaking of your artistic, you know, speaking of using art as process. Um, you know, could you share a bit with us about what your artistic practice is and what informs it? Well, most recently I have been working uh, for the past maybe five years now on a series of mermaid collages. And the concept behind that work is that um, the mermaids live in a space, in the space where the depths of the ocean where no one has ever visited and the depths of outer space where no one has ever visited or no human what is what I mean when I say no one has ever visited. Um, I imagine that as being one space and that's where these mermaids live. And this, my kind of obsession with mermaids started, I was always hearing stories growing up from my parents about fair maids in Guyana and people seeing them and it being like this very common thing. And I always was really fascinated by that and, and became fascinated with mermaid images. But growing up in the mainstream here, it was always white mermaids that um, I had access to. So then I began creating this whole kind of pantheon of or archetypes of black and mer black mermaids and 
mermaids from all different backgrounds and um and then it, it this idea of mermaid comes up throughout the african diaspora and afro-caribbean diaspora with mommy water and the river mama and yamaya so all of those things are coming through in the work all right um and so in, 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 so you said for the past five years you've been working on this. Where, where, has, your, where has this work been seen? Um, it's been seen at um, Queen's Museum. It's been seen at um, EFA Gallery for the Whitney ISP exhibition. Uh, also at, um, at Hostos at the Longwood Gallery. Um, also in um, Kansas City, Missouri at, what's the name of that gallery? Corner in Spanish. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been showing in, in, a, in a number of places. Right, and, and, and could you share with us like what the response to it has been? Have you been having to explain yourself to people or explain your art to people or is, or has it, how, how, how has it been received? Um, it's been, I feel like it hasn't been as well, well received as prior work. I feel like, um, some people are turned off by the fact that I use a lot of celebrities in the work. And, um, but for me, it's this idea of how, when our ancestors came to like the new world and throughout the Americas and Caribbean, and they weren't allowed to keep their own deities. So they hid them behind the Catholic saints. And so similarly, um, I'm using these celebrity figures who we deify and they're representing other archetypes, but a lot, but you know, that's hard to express through an image. And mm -hmm. so a lot of people are turned off by it. And some people are like, I've had a couple of people say like, I should only use people who are deceased. I shouldn't use living celebrities. And, all sorts of things so but um, then also on the other hand some people also find it to be really beautiful right 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 so so what what impact has that had on you as you have continued to work on it like, like the, the those comments um i mean it's interesting because i feel like i i'm not finished with this body of work yet so i am continuing to work on it and so um so it's a little bit frustrating, especially as I've been applying for residencies over the past couple of years, trying to get studio space. Uh, this is my bedroom right here. And this is a piece I'm working on right now. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I have, I don't have a lot of space to work in. So I've been like applying for studio spaces and residencies because also I uh, don't have the money to rent a studio space, but, um, but I've just been getting lots and lots and lots of rejections. So I'm like, okay, is this just, not good work should i be doing something else and then i get i've gotten advice from other artist friends who are like you know you should take it in a different direction or do something else with it but um this is what i'm inspired to do with it right now and i i don't want it to feel forced or like i'm trying to make it be something it's not because i don't i don't think that's good art or and that's not because as we were saying for me it's about the process so i can't really think about like okay th let me try to make something that people will like in order to get the accolades. But one thing I have tried to do, I will be honest, is that when I've applied for, um, for residencies, I've tried to say, okay, let me try to like play up the slavery aspect because I know a lot of times they really wanna hear black people do work about slavery. And there is folklore about um, that during the Middle Passage when our ancestors were being brought over and many of them leapt into the Atlantic Ocean, that they were transformed into mermaids and swam back home. So I have tried with proposals to highlight that more, that maybe like if I highlight the slavery portion more that, you know, they'll be more into it, but that hasn't worked either. You're right. Okay. Um, and, and, and then so sort of talking a little more about your process, what, what is it that you are working through um, with this work? Like what is this work helping you to process right now? That's a good question. Um, because it's, it, it's, 
I've used it in so many different ways. So it's, some of it is very political. Some of it is playful. Some of it is like, has like magical or magical spiritual intentions. It's like um, manifesting things through it. So it's, there's such a ring. I can even show you one that this, I just <laughs> recently um, made this. This is me as a little girl that I made into a mermaid. Can you see that? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, so that's, um, now I'm working on using uh, myself and friends in it as well. So it has been a range. It's like, I don't want to say it's like, oh, it's <laughs> I'm trying not to say it's like a religion, but it's like creating a, you know, my own religion. It's like serving many different purposes. Okay. Okay. And then, so this, this particular work is, is, is collage, right? Could mm -hmm. you, um, could you talk to us a little bit about, about the process of collaging and how you approach it? Yeah. Um, I really love the feeling of cutting and pasting. And I really, the reason why I started to cut up magazine images and reform them into different things is because, um, I know of the negative effects of growing up. I mean, now it's changed somewhat. Now there's a lot more access to seeing black people and dark skinned people in the mainstream a lot more than when I was growing up. But mm -hmm. I was always obsessed with these magazines and these like um, teen magazines, like teen and 17 and YM. And there was nothing about black girls or black people's hair or black people's skin. And so, um, being aware of that, but also being really dazzled by these images and other fashion magazines. And um, we just had like Essence and Ebony, and that was for a much older demographic. Mm -hmm. And um, it's I'm, at what Essence is now is very different than when I was younger. Really? But um, so I began to like re remix these images and create and kind of politicize them and turn them into um, more of what I wanted to see and make political commentary out of them. So it was like taking something that I loved, but I also knew was contributing to my self-hatred and working that out through collage and cutting and pasting. Okay. Okay. Um, so when I met you, well, the second time I met you was at an event that you were hosting. Um, where you were uh, launching a book. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm a little later, I'm gonna ask you to talk about that. But why I'm bringing it up now is because at that event, you were actually collaging. Yeah. Um, so is that, and it was in a public space. So, any, so, so people were able to observe you as you worked. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you typically do? And, 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 and again, how does that work with your process? Yeah, that's something that I started doing over the last year. Um, just in 2019, I, I did three or four performances of live collaging where I wanted to, I've seen a lot of people do live drawing performances. So I wanted to do a live collage performance. And typically I'll have video projection over it of music videos. Um, I've done it a few different ways, but um, I really wanted to play with the idea of, of making the process public and, and I, and I like it. I like it a lot. It's, it changes the energy of the work. It changes mm -hmm. the way that I'm thinking about the work. It brings in the energy of the different people in the room. So it's really nice. And then what I've done since we've started quarantine is that um, this piece behind me that I've been working on, I've been working on it exclusively on Instagram live. Okay. So it's kind of a different iteration of that performance. Um, you can't, the lighting and all the glitter, it's hard to really see it. But um, so that's been interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so there's another last question on this and we'll move on. Um, how, how has the interaction with the audience been on Instagram Live? Like, what, what has that experience been like? Well, I, it's been basically like people coming in and out. Some people will come in for a few minutes. Some people just come in to say hi. It's been nice because it's been like people I maybe haven't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and then some people stay for a longer amount of time and will comment about the work or ask questions about the work. And then that affects it. And um, 
I feel like everything that happens while I'm making a piece goes into the piece in a way. Mm -hmm. So I really like when people ask questions or interact or comment about it in some way. Okay. All right. All right. So now let's talk about your Guyanese connection. So as we mentioned in the beginning, you, you, your, your parents are Guyanese. Um, so tell us a bit about them and about what it was like being raised by Guyanese parents in, in, in Queens. Um, so yeah, my parents are both from Guyana and they're both educators. Um, both were educators home, back home and came here and did other things as well. Uh, my father was a journalist and an author. They're both retired now. Um, and my mother worked for the Board of Education in an administrative building when she came here. Uh, well, she had a number of jobs, but that was where she retired. Right. And um, and yeah, so it was interesting growing up here because on my block, people really didn't have an understanding. We grew up around a lot of Black Americans and they didn't really have an understanding of Guyanese culture. And we were like the weirdos of the block. Mm -hmm. I've come to find out there was another Guyanese family, but I don't know, for some reason, like we were the weirdos. And, um, but my parents, I grew up with parents who were constantly talking about Guyana, talking about Guyanese culture. Um, so I, I grew up completely immersed in the culture and not just my parents, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, um, cause you know, most of my family migrated from Guyana, uh, or emigrated. What's the right word for that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but most of my family came here from Guyana, was born in Guyana and came here. And then there are those of us who were born here. So I, I've always been immersed in the culture. And, um, and, and so would you say that as an artist, you sort of, like, how much, how much, how much is the culture and how much does your upbringing inform your practice? Um, I would say a lot. I, it's, it's hard to kind of like come out of myself and see how much of it is or isn't. But I think like, um, my love of all things shiny and gold and sparkly definitely comes from <laughs> Guyanese culture. Okay. Um, I think that, um, the, like my, my parents would not have wanted me to be an artist as, you know, no parents, I think, want their children to be artists, especially immigrant parents, because it's, it's how are you going to make money? How are you going to make a living, et cetera. But at the same time, I think that those values that they taught me and those work ethics I've brought into my art practice. All right. So a couple more questions. Where in Ghana are your parents from? And um, you have any favorite Ghanaian food? Okay. Um, favorite foods? Mm. It's right next to me, I have some bake. <laughs> I love bacon <laughs> goldfish. Okay. My, my father always makes fun of me for how I say saltfish. Um, like, it's not saltfish, it's saltfish. Or in his accent, I can't say his accent, but I have my queen's accent. Um, so that's one of my faves. Um, Korean roti, lowry, I could go on. Uh, but um, and before I stopped eating meat, pepper pot. Okay. <laughs> but um, and what the other question is, where are they from? Both sides of my family are from Buxton, but my mother was raised in Campbellville with her grandmother and her aunt. So my mother didn't know my father when they were in Guyana. They met when they were here. But my father knew all of the rest of my mother's family from Buxton. He knew my mother's parents and siblings, but, um, and was kind of like low key skimming on my mother because he had seen her. But then when they got here, he was able to meet her through um, my mother's cousin. Okay, okay. <laughs> all, right. all right, so one of the personas you have is the glitter priestess. Um, so can you, talk, can you talk a little bit about that and how you arrived at it and what it means? Yeah, so uh, thank you for asking that. Glitter priestess is basically a title that encompasses all of the work that I do in art and healing and the fact that 
Uh, a lot of the things I do are glittery, glittery and sparkly. Uh, prior to Glitter Priestess, I was going by Herb Girl. Okay. And that started like in the early 2000s. My cousin, Adana Collins, had started this magazine called Mahogany Blues. And uh, there were four of us as part of a collective putting out that magazine. Um, Keisha Noel, Shadaga, Sean Ferdinand, myself, and my cousin, Adana. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was the editor-in-chief of the magazine, but the title that I used was Priestess of Content. Mm -hmm. And I was writing a column called Herb Girl, where I was sharing herbal remedies, home remedies, things like that. It was a, ma a magazine about politics, arts, and culture for Black people. And, um, and healing was always something that was part of my practice. I had taken a course also in the early 2000s at the Open Center, an herbal medicine course. Mm -hmm. So I was sharing the things that I had learned from that, and I, it's something that I've continued to research and work through. And then when I went to grad school and I started to um, do videos, I started to create these herb girl videos where I was doing how to's with herbal medicine. Mm. And then, um, and then as I started to like get thirties, I was like, okay, I don't feel comfortable calling myself girl anymore. <laughs> so then I, my sister who's a business coach during one of our sessions, we were, we were like worked through a million different titles and then finally settled on Glitter Priestess. Okay. And so how, how, you, how do you move about the world in, in that title and how is it received? Um, it's, it's interesting. I don't know. I think that is also something that puts people off along with the mermaid thing. Um, I think a lot of people just don't get it. Um, but it's, for me, it's the fact that as we were saying earlier, like for me, art, is a healing practice and art is a spiritual practice mm -hmm. and healing is part of my art practice. And so to me in that sense, um, and, the, and the reason why I, when I was working on the magazine and I called myself priestess of content is because I was reading about these ancient priestesses mm -hmm. who would use art and music and dance for healing and they would use plants and they would use sexual energy and they would just, everything was used mm -hmm. in the purpose of healing. And I right. was like, I like that definition of priestess and I feel like I embody that or I want to embody that. Like it's aspirational and also current. So that's how I came to that. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know how people receive it. How do you receive it? I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I saw it. I was like, good priestess okay this reminds me of the of the you know those little girls that like the it's the same type of energy with the sparkly um the stuff that you see on tv right the mm -hmm. the the types of images and toys they create for little girls mm -hmm. um so not 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 that it makes you a little girl mm -hmm. but it's that energy so it's it's kind of like you tapping into your inner child mm -hmm. energy and expressing that this little girl. Yeah. <laughs> Full priestess mode, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Full priestess mode. So yeah, that's 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 how I see it. Um, and I thought it was very uh, creative, and it's just in line with everything else that I see in terms of your in terms of your work. Um, so there. Okay. <laughs> Here's one thought. Um, so and so talking about healing, um, the other thing that you are as a Reiki practitioner. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm one of those people, I don't know anything about Reiki. I've heard about it. And I've never actually taken the time to learn more myself. So could you talk a little bit about um, what led you to that particular practice? Mm -hmm. And again, how, you, how, it, how it is a thing that you use in your art or in your life? Yeah, so Reiki is an energy healing modality and it's an it's an energy healing that is transmitted through the hands or channeled through, and it comes through the hands. Usually done in person, hands-on, but it can also be sent over distances. And I first started practicing Reiki in 2006. And at that time it was mostly with uh, working on myself and people close to me. And um, then over the past few years, I went and I got another attunement um, even though I had already gotten all three levels the first time, but I kind of wanted to get a refresher course mm. a few years ago. And um, 
And then I started to work more with clients. And then recently with the quarantine, I started to make videos uh, for different issues relating to the quarantine for essential workers, for people who are pregnant or giving birth for people who are depressed or grieving or lonely. Um, most recently, I made one about frustration about the police killing black people. So it's, um, it's just, it's a healing energy that comes to the hands. And, oh, and then a few days ago, I had a live event to kick off the Culture Push Symposium where people, well, we met on Zoom like this and um, I created a playlist of hip hop, R&B, soul music. I called the Black Power Reiki Hour playlist. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just listened to music while I transmitted Reiki to everyone who was present. Okay. Okay. Um, and, you know, so I don't know if, I don't know because I don't live in Guyana, but I visit often. Um, so I, I think I've met one other person in Guyana who I know is a Reiki practitioner. Um, so again, you know, how does it, how does your family, you know, uh, what's the what's the word here how, how does your family um engage with you and your art and and your reiki and your priestess <laughs> and all of this how 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 you know how 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 do you exist with this in your family uh my family is very supportive you know they come to my shows and they i practice reiki on my family and yeah, I think, I mean, I've always been a weirdo, so my family just accepts me, <laughs> and um, when, I was, when I was much younger, like, in my teens and in my 20s, my father did, like, try to get me to do more kind of um, mainstream jobs and mainstream career, I should say, but um, I, you know, they realized that's futile, and <laughs> so they, <laughs> thankfully, they accept me. Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> Listen. Um, all right. So last, the the last thing subject I want to touch on before before we end this is um, the current situation here in the United States um, with the unrest um, that's resulting from the continued violence against um, black bodies. Um, so just could you share with us like? how this has impacted you and the ways in which you are engaging with what is happening now. Yeah, I mean, God, it's, 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 it's just continued trauma, continued stress. So for me, I'm just really leaning on my healing tools and my healing practices. It, already at, with the quarantine and the pandemic, we were already really stressed and emotionally drained and exhausted. I say we because I myself and everybody around me, I'm just assuming you as well. Um, and then on top of that, this new wave of violence against Black people. And it's just, it's a lot. It's very heavy. It's, it's, it's exhausting. So yeah, for me, it's yoga, meditation, chanting. Um, a lot of texting with my friends, trying to find something funny to watch every day, trying to find something inspiring to watch because this barrage of images of violence and, and bad news that we're getting from social media and, and mainstream news is, is just really overwhelming. And it's also interesting to see um, the difference between the news that people are reporting on social media from now. This is like, a am going off on a tangent, but the, when you can see like the firsthand accounts of people um, who are on the front lines of the protests and things sharing their footage and then what they're actually showing as news on TV is really, it's crazy what the mainstream news, how they skew their stories. Right. But, but um, and, and all of that is stressful and all of that is traumatic. Yes. Um, the narrative that they're creating about us and, and knowing that and watching a black man be murdered over and over and over again because that image keeps coming up again and again and again and again mm -hmm. so also trying to avoid what i didn't watch the whole video of him being murdered of george floyd being murdered i didn't watch it at all could not that's good yeah i don't think it's i don't think it's healthy mm -hmm. um and so avoiding that avoiding 
I'm trying not to be too much in that and um and then seeing like which organizations I can support financially. I haven't gone out into the streets to protest or anything. I hadn't been going anywhere anyway because of the um quarantine. Right. So so yeah, just trying to maintain mental health and, and support where I can and um and using Reiki to be supportive as well. Great. Um, and have you seen any any of uh, any of this filtering into your work as yet? Okay, so the only way that it has that this new moment has surfaced in my work so far is that I created a video specifically for um, Reiki for frustration around police killing black people. Um, but I haven't created any work specifically about this yet. All right. Well, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you, Damali, uh, Glitter Priestess, mm -hmm. Reiki practitioner, mm -hmm. all around Guyanese American artists. Um, thank you for spending time with us, um, letting us get to know you a little better and sharing your art and your work with us. Thank you so much for wanting to talk to me. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. And now we move on to movies. Yeah. Enjoy. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Kenry Cairo, and I'm the writer and director of Hidden World. Thank you so much for checking out my intro, and hopefully you will enjoy the movie. Hidden World is very special to me, because it's my first opportunity to present part of my culture to the world. I am a Suriname Maroon from the Okanisi tribe. My ancestors freed themselves from slavery and lived in the forest. They raised war against the slave masters and founded an independent Maroon state on the 10th of October 1760, more than 100 years before slavery was abolished in Suriname. Hidden World is about the spiritual communication with our ancestor spirits. This form of communication and the knowledge is under threat. Let's find out if we can take away this threat in my documentary, Hidden World. Thank you very much. Tell <laughs> 